Well, we're ending our conversation series, so we're looking at conversations that Jesus had with people in the New Testament, uh, specifically in the Gospels, and we're seeing what we can learn from them as he talks to other people. And inevitably, he's talking to you and I in these conversations. We're the secondary ones. We're the ones that uh, are watching, but we're trying to learn from his words. And I think we are learning from those words. I just talked to a couple people uh, before the service today, and, and they just really appreciated the last couple of weeks, and, and uh, not just the time uh, in, in, in God's Word together, but the time worshiping together. And uh, I just had to agree. Like, it's just been really sweet, and I'm really thankful for that. And I don't know why the Holy Spirit shows up sometimes in, in, in more powerful ways than others, but um, we're just begging Him to show up in, in mighty ways and to change us and to use us and to um, uh, just let us enjoy his glory and participate in the goodness and the greatness of God in our lives. And uh, that's a, an awesome thing to do. And uh, we can do it in, in, in so many different ways and in so many different places um, to, to actually be part of God's kingdom coming on earth and to experience the presence of God, our maker in our lives it's a real thing. It's an experiential thing. It's not merely a, a mental progression that we take to make sure our sins are forgiven and then we're on our way to heaven. There's actually an experience that happens with Christians who know God as their Savior and as their Lord. Much of Jesus' teaching then, and we've seen some of it, has to, has to do with this idea of the kingdom of God. Jesus will say, uh, you can look at Matthew chapter 13, he says seven different times what the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of God. He says the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. He, somebody goes out and plants it and it grows into a tree and all the birds come and nests in it. Then he says the kingdom of God is like yeast. It's like leaven that goes into a bread and it's, it spreads out through the, all of the dough. It's like, what in the world are you talking about, Jesus? The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is like that. He'll say things like the kingdom of God is, is like a treasure that somebody has and they bury it. And, uh, and then they come back and they buy that land that they knew that that treasure was buried in because they had to have it. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. That's what the kingdom of God is like. And he speaks to many people in, in sort of a, a mysterious way about the kingdom of, of God about this kingdom that is to come. But the big idea is this, is that it's awesome. It's the reign of God on earth. It's the rule and reign of Jesus Christ here and now. It's the defeat of evil. Think of evil. Think of some of the most horrendous things that have ever happened to you. Think of those things that you fear. Think of those things, well, some of us fear things that are good. So maybe that's not the case, but um, all of this, the defeat of evil, the, the defeat of Satan, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We are to pray for this day, and why wouldn't we pray for this day to come? No more suffering, no more dying, no more pain, no more struggling with sin. And that's why we pray the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We pray for the kingdom to come fully. Now in Jesus' day, Jesus lived in uh, Jerusalem and the surrounding areas from Galilee and Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth, in the ancient Near East, uh, actually becoming not so ancient into the first century. But in Jesus' day, the Romans occupied Israel. So they were a nation that was under occupation. They didn't control their own destiny, so to speak. And so the current kingdom in the nation of Israel during this time that Jesus is going to have this conversation this morning uh, was where Satan reigned, where evil reigned, and where Rome reigned, where Caesar reigned. In the book of Acts, we have this phrase that the church starts using. It's, it's, the, it's this, it's Jesus is Lord. And that was opposite to the, the term that was used, that same term was used for Caesar. Caesar is Lord. They, they begin to say that Jesus is Lord. They begin to talk about a different reign that was coming, a different rule, a different kingdom. But in Jesus' day, the Rome, Romans were the ones 
with the power and with the authority. Now the Jews who Jesus initially spoke to had an idea of what this kingdom of God was. Um, as a matter of fact, the, the book of Matthew, my, Matthew writes this gospel and he, he steers it and directs it towards Jewish people and he, and he seeks to show them that Jesus is the anointed one, that Jesus is the king that is to come, that Jesus is the Messiah. And that's why we go to the place in the Bible that I bet you, you skip over, Matthew chapter 1, all the genealogy. It's there to show that Jesus is the king. He is the promised king that is to come. So the Jews had some idea of this idea of the kingdom of God. And it was wrapped up and it was tied up with the kingdom of Israel. And rightly so. So let me give you just a brief history of, of the kingdom that the, the Jews who are talking to Jesus here in Matthew chapter 20 would, would have as kind of their basis, base understanding of the kingdom. And then hopefully we can have that same base and then we can understand a little bit better um, we pray uh, what Jesus is saying. Go all the way back with me to uh, Genesis chapter 11. There all the peoples of, of the earth have gathered together. We don't know how many there were. But they're all gathered together and they're kind of in one accord. And they say, let's build something. Let's build something incredible. And they build a, a tower. And that tower is called the Tower of Babel. And this is actually ancient Babylon, the city that begins. And God sees what they are doing, according to Genesis chapter 11, and they um, are wanting to ascend to heaven. They are having a grandiose sense of self, and God uh, disperses them, and he disperses them by doing what? What does he do to them? He mixes up their language, and, and the languages of the earth are born, and, and they spread out over the earth. And then in Genesis chapter 12, the immediate chapter after, Jesus, uh, God, Jesus is there, no, no doubt, God in the flesh, but God um, calls Abram to be a father of the great nation of Israel in Genesis chapter 12, and he says that you will be a great nation, and through you, all of the kingdoms of the world will be blessed. So God after he disperses the earthly kingdom in Genesis 11, in Genesis 12 calls this man Abram to be a father of a great kingdom that is to come, a kingdom that's going to be bigger and better than just an earthly kingdom. There's a promise of a heavenly kingdom that's part of this earthly kingdom. He says, that guy's coming. He's going to bless everybody. All of the nations will get to be a part of this kingdom. But I'm going to start with you, Abram. Fast forward then uh, to the Egyptian slavery. The book of Exodus is the story of the nation of Israel, which had been birthed now. God had done what he said. He had raised up a people, but they were enslaved in Egypt. And God calls them out of Egypt, and he raises up a, a man. This man's name starts with an M and ends in Oses. Moses goes, and he leads the people out of the nation of uh, Egypt, and they're saved and they're delivered and, and you remember the plagues and, and um, all the things that happened and God is with them, his presence is with them like a pillar of fire at the night, in the nighttime. It's a cloud during the daytime. God is with his people. He's leading them out of slavery toward the promised land, toward a kingdom that is yet to come as he delivers the nation of Israel. Fast forward through the time of the judges to the time of the kings. And God raises up a great king. His name is David. And this king David, when he was very young, probably a, a teenager, he, he kills the leader of the Philistine army, the great warrior. His name was Goliath. He kills him, and, 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 and the nation of Israel is freed from the bondage of the kingdom of the Philistines. And they have a new king, a great king, David, and there was no king like him, a warrior king, and yet a king that was after God's own heart. Then, fast forward even years more, Israel is captured by Babylon, taken and carted off into slavery. But God promises not to leave his people. God promises to restore the kingdom someday. Someday. And into this world we go 
to Matthew chapter 20. And we see the disciples who grew up learning this history are there with Jesus. Some of the disciples' mothers are there. We'll see at least one of them. And they ask Jesus something really in particularly interesting about this kingdom. In Psalm chapter 2, in light of the history of, of, of God throughout the pages of Scripture, the writer of Psalm 2 says this about the nations and about the kingdoms. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. He will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. So the songs that the disciples sang as they were growing up were songs of this great kingdom that was to come and the anointed one, the Messiah, the king that would sit on the throne who would crush anyone who would dare stand against him. And his home, his mountain was on Zion. It was in Jerusalem. It was where God would come and be with man. And now Jesus is here and he appears and he comes in Luke chapter 4 and he's in his hometown and he's reading the scriptures from Isaiah chapter 61 and he's reading that uh, there's coming a day when this king is going to come and he's going to set the captives free and he's going to give the blind their sight and he's going to do all these sorts of things that are just incredible when the kingdom comes and he sets down the Bible and he says today in your hearing the scripture is fulfilled. Amen. Jesus is this anointed one. Jesus is this Messiah. At least he's claiming to be. Isaiah 61 goes on to talk about the reign and rule of this Messiah and how he would do it. And how all of the nations would come and if they, and they would be crushed if they would refuse the kingdom. But that the whole world would be blessed by this great king and this great kingdom. So the disciples have this in their background, but yet Jesus has to teach them, and he teaches us, what the kingdom is actually like. So in our passage, we read today that the kingdom is about humility. Humility. So let me lay my cards out on the table today. That's the application point for you and for me is humility. The way of the kingdom is, is not the, the way of pride and power over other people. It's service and love that comes under to others. And so here's the story in Matthew chapter 20. Now we're ready, starting at verse 20. Okay, Matthew 20, 20. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up with to him, Jesus, and with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked for him something. And he said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your kingdom. Jesus answered, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, We are able. He said to them, You will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. And when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
This is an incredible story um, because we see what happens here uh, when a mom gets involved with her boys. And uh, why are you all laughing? I haven't even said anything yet. And uh, mom loves her boys, right? And uh, mom's, this is mom coming to the practice field, okay? And she's coming to the basketball court, coach, and she's going she's gonna to watch her boys, make sure they get playing time, make sure they're giving their due. And uh, here comes mom coming to Jesus, and she wants to talk about her boys. Now, one thing to mention, these boys, her boys, probably aren't that old. Did you know the disciples were probably in their late teens, early 20s as well? And so uh, it's, not, it's not that big of a deal. These guys weren't like... 30 years old living in their parents basement and uh, and mom's trying to get rid of them and, and push them off to Jesus these guys are young guys okay they're very young guys these are the sons of Zebedee they're given the nickname the sons of thunder they're James and John so they're two of the three that were the closest to Jesus so Jesus has his 12 disciples and then he had the three that were the closest to him Peter James and John James and John are uh, the sons of thunder they were they got, they got fired up man let's do this Jesus let's overthrow the Romans let's build your kingdom now and uh, their mom was uh, Salome that's her name she was at the foot of the cross when Jesus was crucified along with Jesus' mother, Mary, who was Salome's sister, and Mary Magdalene at the foot of the cross. So James and John are cousins to Jesus. Okay? So she comes. She brings her boys. And, and she asks Jesus this interesting question. Now, um, to understand the way of the kingdom... We must understand some things. I'm going to give you four things this morning, okay? The first one is this. Christ's kingdom is here, and it is coming. It's here already, and it is coming. In her question that she asked, she shows her understanding of the kingdom. She says, and she kneeling before Jesus, this is an act of worship. This is not a woman who is the... Well, you know, the helicopter mom that's not showing respect. She is respectful. She's worshiping toward the Lord. And she says, put my two sons next to you, one to your right, one to your left, in your kingdom, in your kingdom. She knew that Jesus was coming and he was bringing the kingdom, the kingdom of, of heaven, the kingdom of God, the kingdom that was yet to come. So Jesus, when he read the scriptures from Isaiah 61, and he says, today you're, you're in your hearing the scripture is fulfilled, it was. The king had come. The Messiah had arrived. But the kingdom was not fully here already. Now it's interesting to note um, that I think that she thought and the disciples thought that Jesus was on his way to do this in Jerusalem. He's going to Jerusalem. Um, even though Jesus had told them that he must suffer and die and be crucified, Jesus had told the disciples time and time again, they thought that he's on his way to Jerusalem. And we didn't know all about the crazy talk, Jesus, but that he was going to go to Jerusalem and take over the place. And that he would set up his kingdom to rule and reign then. They haven't grasped that the way of the kingdom was actually through the death and resurrection of the king. Couldn't grasp that. So Christ's kingdom is here, and it's coming. Now, um, I don't have to talk to very many of you too long to know that you, you all know that the kingdom is coming still. Because you've all experienced that which won't exist in, in the kingdom. You've experienced death. You've experienced sin. You've experienced heartache. You've experienced pain. But we must be reminded that the kingdom is here, in a sense, that the Messiah has come, but it's coming even more so. The second thing that we must understand is that suffering is part of the kingdom. Let me uh, kind of straighten out what's in your notes. You've got to add this. Suffering is part of the coming of the kingdom, back then and still as it comes today. 
It's part of the coming of the kingdom. Suffering is. Jesus says to her, you don't know what you're asking. Are they able to drink of the cup that I'm going to drink of? Now, this cup in Jewish thought is, is equal to someone's life and their destiny. That's their cup. What is to come? It's also a metaphor in the Old Testament for God's wrath. And that's why you remember Jesus in the garden before he goes to the cross for our sins. He says in his prayer to God, God, if, if you can, let this cup pass from me. The cup was all the wrath of God against the sin of the world, against your sin and my sin, the sin that he was going to pay for by his blood. He said, if there's some way, let that cup pass, the cup so there is suffering, and, and uh, here's what they say. This is amazing. They say to Jesus, they say, yes, we can. We can do what you're going to do. They didn't quite understand what they were even answering. We can do that. And you know what? They did. And Jesus said to them, yes, you are going to drink of the cup. And that's what happened to them. So even though they had this understanding of the kingdom that wasn't quite correct, and even though they knew of the cup, they didn't understand Jesus was going to die and rise again. They knew that there's suffering in it. They knew that there was something in that cup. And Jesus said, you will do it. But they didn't, at this time, realize that the cup for them meant death and exile. So James, one of the sons of thunder, he dies in Acts chapter 12. You can read about it. And he's the first apostle, he's the first disciple who loses his life for the sake of Christ. The first martyr in, in the church is Stephen, but the first apostle to die is James. He dies as, as a leader of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 12. And you can read about his death in uh, extra-biblical sources as well. It was a horrific death that he died. As he's thrown off the temple, as he's beaten to death proclaiming that Jesus, his cousin, excuse me, um, that, was the other, that was the other James. There's two James. Sorry, I'm getting confused now. He died, James, the half-brother of Jesus, proclaiming that Jesus, his half-brother, was Lord. James, his cousin, uh, is Lord. And then the Apostle John, the Apostle John who... who uh, goes on to write the book of Revelation. He's exiled to the island of Patmos where he dies as an exile, as a prisoner, as a, a, an outcast for the sake of Christ. Suffering is part of the coming of the kingdom. It is. Now, we will suffer in our lifetime. And Christian, you will suffer. And, and so much of our suffering is due to our poor choices. So we, we have to say this, just to be honest. Our sin, our rebellion, will bring about suffering. Our own choices in regards to health, in regards to our family, those choices will bring about suffering as well. But there is a suffering that will happen when you... Take a stand for the kingdom. When you live for the kingdom, when you live as part of the kingdom, when you do the will of God, when you stand for truth, when you refuse to sin, there is suffering that will happen, and it might even be your end. We have such a great life in our country, don't we? Here in the Western, civilized, Christianized Becoming less and less so, but we have a great life, don't we? But there is a way that leads to suffering and, and death even, and that's the way of the kingdom. So you might have heard this growing up. I know I heard this a lot of time. Um, hey, just hang in there. Don't, don't worry. It's all going to work out in the end. Just as long as you do what's right, it'll all work out in the end. But here's the way of the kingdom. The reality is that working out in the end might mean you're dead. And that's the way of the kingdom. It's suffering. It's suffering. Suffering is part of the coming of the kingdom. Now these, these uh, brothers, um, mom didn't want to hear that, no doubt. But they were ready for it. They said, yeah, bring it on, Jesus. We'll, we'll take the cup. 
But then the part of the kingdom that is our application part this morning is this idea of selfishness. Selfishness is not part of the kingdom. Not in Jesus' day. Not in our day. Not ever. Not in the age to come when the kingdom is fully here. There's no place for selfishness. That's what, that's what they, uh, Jesus says to them. You don't even know what you're asking. I, it's not up to me is it, to put them at my right hand or my left hand. They're being selfish. Mom is, is being selfish. She I can't falter. I, I want the best for my kids. I want the best for my boys. I want the best for my daughter. I, I do. How many of you want the same things? But there's some things that we, we can't have control over. And there's a selfishness here to say that these two, over the other ten, deserve the place. Maybe it was because they were cousins. Maybe because they had that, uh, that position. Whatever it may be, selfishness is not part of the kingdom. And this is where the rubber meets the road for us. Now, the desire to share in Christ's glory is not a bad desire. Okay? The desire to do great things is not sin. The desire to succeed is not evil. The desire for the glory of God is not bad. Okay? We know this because the chapter earlier in Matthew 19, verse 27, following Peter says, Jesus, we've given up everything to follow you. What's in it for us, Jesus? And Jesus says, anyone who gives up their, their homes, everyone who gives up uh, anything for me and my kingdom will receive it a hundredfold in the kingdom that's still yet to come. So there is a promise of reward. There is a promise of glory. And that's not a bad thing. In Romans 8, chapter, or chapter 8, verse uh, 12, Paul writes, if we share in Christ's sufferings, we will also share in his glory. We get to share in the glory of the king. That means accolades. That means a good feeling. That means um, we're given props. That means we're part of the celebration. That means we're part of the king. And uh, so that's not a bad thing. The desire to succeed and to do well and to, and, and to, and, and to receive glory even with Christ. That's not a bad thing. But the problem is how we go about pursuing this glory. That's where the problem comes in. And these boys were pursuing it the wrong way. Mom was going to ask for it. They thought they maybe deserved it. And, uh, and we see three wrong ways here that they pursue this greatness or this glory. And it's three wrong ways that we do it, okay? So let me give it to you. Three wrong way ways that we pursue greatness. Number one. First one is power politics, we we'll call it, Okay? This is really what's happening here. These are Jesus' cousins. They want, they desire to have these seats of power, to, to be on the right and to be at the uh, left hand of the king was a very prominent place to be. It was an important place. It was a, a place of power. It was a place of prestige. It was a place of honor. And, uh, and, and they said, hey, we're Jesus' cousins. And uh, mom's, mom's talking to Jesus. Mom's Jesus' aunt. Okay? And uh, who do you know? You're counting on the people that you know to, for greatness. And if you can talk to the right people, if you can butter them up enough, if you can get to the right people, um, they can exalt you. Whether it's in the schools for your kids, or if it's in the business world, or if it's in your neighborhood, or, or yes, if it's even in the church. If I can even play politics in the church, and if I can even uh, ascend to the position and the seats of power and prestige in the church. Man, I, my, my house is, and my home is crumbling, my, my business is failing, and everything's faltering. But at least at the church, I can go there and I can exert some power. Power politics. It's a wrong way to pursue greatness and glory. How about this way? Call it dominant dictatorship. Jesus answers them. He says this. 
after they all come together and, and the ten are they're mad at the two they're like hey why are you guys asking this and no doubt I, I would like to think that the other ten were like you guys that's not the way of the kingdom the way of the kingdom is not that you're being selfish is that what they did though no they were selfish themselves they beat they beat them to the punch you guys beat us to ask Jesus for the right and left you shouldn't have asked for that why they wanted it themselves and you got your mom here doing your bidding Jesus says the answer to that. He, he says, hey, the pagans do that. The rulers of the Gentiles, they lord it over them. This is a power of position to lord it over somebody. It's a dictatorship. A lot of pastors in the church fall into this way. To have the power over someone, to, to lord it over the power of position. One of my professors, actually whom I, whom I studied his writings for, for this message, and who was one of my favorite professors at seminary, phenomenal guy. I, I only talked to him one time. I tried to talk to him. It was after a class, seminary class. I caught up to him real quick and, and was walking and, and talking with him. And he barely looked at me. Barely gave me a, a word to answer. He, he didn't have any time. And now, I, sh I don't know what was going on in his life. Maybe he had some, a very you know, good reason to, and so I don't want to be overly judgmental, but I do want to have an illustration here. So it was very mean. It was very domineering. It was very dictating, <laughs> dictatorship uh, toward me. And uh, he, I really did get the sense that he was in the ivory tower, and I wasn't to approach him and his greatness. That's, that's what I got the feeling of. Um, but I still use his books and his class was fantastic so I, I forgive him for that um, but that's the way of the pagans that's not the way of the kingdom the way of the kingdom is not to lord your position over anybody else that you're more blessed than somebody else because of your position that's not reason to get them to do what you want them to do to treat them any differently the last one is what I can call um, charismatic control. Jesus says these Gentiles, they lord their position over their others, and their great ones, look at verse 25, their great ones exercise authority over them. Their great ones. Great talker, a great personality, somebody who's got a lot of money and a lot of uh, a ways to uh, influence someone. They will use all that they have to put themselves forward. Charismatic control. Someone who's, who's got a lot of money and who can, who, who, who can use it strategically to make a lot of friends that will be on their side when, when, when it really matters the most. Or somebody who's a real great talker and, and they can really sweet talk anybody to be on their side when the chips are down and we pursue greatness in these wrong ways, whether it's the power of position or the power of uh, prestige and being known or the, the power of personality. The kingdom way is not to seek greatness through who you know or by being the bully or by being a sweet talker the way of the kingdom is the way of Christ. And that leads to number four, our last point this morning. To understand the kingdom, we must understand that Jesus is the ultimate example of selfless suffering. He is. They're on their way to Jerusalem. Jesus is about to be crucified for the sins of the world. And, and what does he do in the upper room before the Last Supper, and he's with his disciples, what did he do to them? What act did he do to demonstrate his love? He washed their feet. He washed their feet. He served them, and then he gave his life. Not just as an example, but as a ransom for us. Look at verse 27. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. You want to be first. The way of the kingdom is not to lord your position 
Whatever that position is, and however the way you got that, it's not to lord it over anybody to make them do your bidding. That's not the way of the kingdom. The way of the kingdom and the way that you exert influence isn't from the top down. It's from the bottom up in the kingdom. That's, that's the upside down kingdom. The top down is I have the power, I have the authority, I have the position, I have the, the, the money, and I'm going to make people do what I want them to do. I can shape and control and influence them that way. The way of the kingdom is, is from the bottom up. It's fr from love and through service and through being a slave, actually, to others that's going to change them and influence them, not to my will, but to God's will and to the kingdom's way. Jesus is the ultimate example because some of us might say, well, man, that just, that just means I'm going to get walked all over. I'm just going to be stomped on. I'm just going to be taken advantage of. And, and, and no, that Jesus had a purpose. Jesus says, no one takes my life. I lay it down. Jesus wasn't trampled on and walked on and stomped on. Je you, all throughout the New Testament, in the Gospels, Jesus did things the way that he wanted to do them. That's what got him in so much trouble. And he upended the temple and destroyed the, uh, the temple grounds. He was the one that was speaking against the scribes and Pharisees. He was the one that was calling them sons of hell but he chose the way of the slave he chose the way of the servant to the cross he is our example in Philippians chapter 2 Paul says this that he humbled himself he humbled himself even to death on the cross so he humbled himself as a person he was born as a baby he had to have his diapers changed he had to be dependent upon mom and dad he did all those things that are despicable really if you think about it to, uh, for a holy and righteous God who's, who's, who's all other in his holiness and yet he condescended became human but then he even humbled himself to death on the cross as a ransom he says, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. This is the idea of redemption. This word for ransom is, is the, the buying back of property or the paying off of your, your mortgage. Freeing a prisoner of war. This is the idea of ransom. He bought us back from evil. He brought us back from the evil kingdom. And he's bringing us into the kingdom that is to come. And he did it by being a servant. He did it by being the one who took the pain and the punishment. And he did this. You see in the text right there, he did this. He gave his life as a ransom for many, many. The word many is a term used in rabbinic writing for the elect community of God. And we know from all of Scripture that this is not just Israel now that's part of the kingdom. The elect contains people from all tribes and tongues and nations. This is awesome, this kingdom. And he calls you to be a part of it, but he calls you to be different from the world around you. He calls you to believe in him to accept his death's payment for your sin, but then to live for him as a kingdom man, as a kingdom woman, knowing that the kingdom is yet to come, and until it does, you will suffer. But don't be selfish. Be like Jesus. And then we pray for that day when the kingdom comes. So we're going to conclude our service, or the sermon. We're going to sing one more song. We're going to conclude the sermon this morning. We're going to pray together the Lord's Prayer, okay? Some of you grew up in a tradition that you pray that all the time, and you know it, and you can rattle it off. Some of you don't know it, and you're just going to pretend like you do, so you don't draw attention to yourselves. But uh, let's pray together uh, the Lord's Prayer, okay? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.